Welcome to the NBA Draft. Do you want a podcast that discusses and breaks down your favorite prospects all the way until they hear their name called on draft night? Luka Doncic. Welcome to the home of NBA Draft Prospects. Words can't describe how I feel right now. This is the Prospect Pod, presented by Hardwood Hoop Central, only on YouTube. All right, so welcome to the Prospect Pod. Today, I'm going to do something a little bit different than what y'all are used to. Uh, Today, I'm going to do an interview with Mr. Josiah Johnson. I say Mr., but listen, Josiah is probably one of the best, most humorous follows on NBA Twitter and just in general. He's a guy that likes speaking his mind. And me personally, I'm somebody who appreciates authentic, genuine voices, and he's got one. So, when he put the call out to say, hey, I want to get on some podcasts, who's doing some podcasts out here? I had to jump in and was like, hey, man, whenever you want to come on, come do it. And he was gracious enough to join me. So, Josiah, appreciate you coming on to the show, brother. What's Thanks up, so man? Much. Thank you for having me, bro. I'm, I'm, I'm excited, man. Let's get this, okay? Let's really do it. That prospect pod. Let's get it. <laughs> All right, man. So, here's here's I'm going to do a couple of little softballs. And as you probably found okay. out from being on Twitter today, it's Go Hoop Day, basketball's global holiday. If you could be anywhere in the world right now playing hoops, where would you go? Uh, man, I would probably, uh, off the top of my head, I would either be somewhere in Hawaii just because I love the scenery and obviously the weather, or I'd be at Poly Pavilion where I played at UCLA. So that's, you know, that, that's my favorite court probably in Los Angeles to go hoop at and just, uh, and it's nice and air conditioned there. It's like 80 some degrees out here today, which ain't too hot. Obviously I know y'all got the humidity and everything out in Orlando, Woo! but, uh, but, uh, you know, brother like myself, I'm, I'm real, you know, more tropical. So I need a little, little cool air every once in a while, man. I had to go to a wedding this, mo- this morning and it was outside. Jesus. Damn. Let me tell you, I, 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 you know, I'm, I'm fair skinned and all that, obviously being a, <laughs> being a cockazoid, but listen, brother, dude, I almost melted. I, I, you know, I got to the point where I was like, you know, we got to fucking go. They wanted hey. me to take pictures. I'm sweating on the camera. I'm like, you know what? This isn't a good look. We got to go. Uh, who do who does weddings? Man? Don't you normally do weddings like 5, 6 <laughs> o'clock, sundown? What's the, what's the, I mean, I thought that was like a, a universal man, wedding, wedding criteria. Let me just tell you. First of all, it's my mother's wedding, so I'm going to say it as okay. respectfully okay. as possible. Okay, well, I'm going to take you know. <laughs> uh, Yeah, it's all good. It's all good. Too many of my family members tend to do things a little non-traditional, so this okay. this fell in line with some other shit that that I've had I've seen go on, but uh, <laughs> it is what it is. Um, all right, so so you would do Hawaii? That listen, the scenery. You know, whenever when I thought about that question, the one thing I thought about was obviously the opening scene to, um, you know, the, the the opening scene to Spike Lee's movie. He got game. Yeah. And obviously, they're going through all the different places. So there's a lot of places in the world where random hoops hanging. Yeah. Mine, man. Look, I'm I'm simple with mine. I, I look at it. I'd rather I want to go to Rucker Park. All the okay. history that's there, and just everything that that yeah. that has been done on that court. I'm all about history. When it, whenever I get it, if I get a chance to be on a court that uh, that I've never played on before, so yeah. that would be mine. Um, I feel but, you. So, I'm a LA dude, though. I, yeah, I'm no. Jump in, but I'm, I'm a LA dude. We rock with New York, and I know everybody in LA talks about the Drew League, but there's also another league I used to grow up hooping in, the Joe Weekly Run Shooting Dunk League that we used to play at Crenshaw High School. It was around like the '80s, '90s. It's funny. It was kind of like the, the winner of the the Joe Weekly League would play the winner of the Drew League. Uh, Joe Weekly uh, tragically passed, unfortunately, and the league wasn't able to sustain. But that'd be another place I love to go hoop at Crenshaw High. You know, just in the summertime, it used to be lit. Coach West, who was a coach at Crenshaw back then, used to have a snack bar going with the chili dogs and the chili Fritos and everything. But that would be another place I love to hoop. But L.A. dudes, like we got respect for New York and everything. But when I hear Rutgers, like it's cool, but it ain't. You know, I'd rather go hoop at the Drew. Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Nah, hey, I, I feel you. I, I've been to the Drew League and, and being in that atmosphere in a small gym with all those people packed. I mean, it, it's it's hard to beat. Yeah. Um, and but obviously, you got air conditioning. Yeah, Rutgers, Rutgers it, though. That East Coast, the East Coast, like, summer ball is a whole nother. Like, I got to go to the Goodman League a couple of years ago and just kind of seeing other leagues out there. You bring the whole city out to be people in the high-rise apartments watching. It's like a whole – it's a whole little world around it, so I can't even hate. Yeah, and no, I, I think of, you know, you, I think uh, was it Adidas or who, who was it that came out with uh, – had uh, – let me think. It was D. I think – no, it was Converse. It was Converse. Shame on me. Okay. Uh, Converse that came out with a video uh, promoting new Converses, and they, they showed Dr. J going through, yeah. uh, going th- going through the park, and all the people sitting up in the high rises. So when you say that, that's what I think of yeah. when it comes to uh, comes comes to those day, that day, that day and time. So yeah. for sure. 
Like, I mean, um, I, I would have loved to see Dr. J play, bro. I would have in the record situation, obviously in the league too, and in the ABA. But I would have loved to see him like the summertime. You know how free it is, dude. Just have fun, man. I think that would have been something. If I could go back in time, I would, I would gladly pay you know a hefty load to go see go see Dr. J. For sure. Um, so you you know you've become known for being able to you know take a meme, write a funny caption, and results in a lot of engagement. When something's trending, let's say like Dame and Marv. Marvin are throwing bars back and forth with each other through SoundCloud. How much thought goes into you and in, into it when you're starting to create those memes and that, that content for your Twitter account? Honestly, man, it really depends what I'm doing at that point. Like sometimes I'm working my square jobs or doing other things in life. So I don't really have a lot of time and energy to focus on it. Uh, so I got to be so quick, quick on the draw. And I just don't have time. Like that's why I started doing a lot of voiceover videos. Like my, my schedule so busy and hectic that I, I write, I write in voiceovers in under 10 minutes generally. So it's like, yeah. look, I can only devote 10 minutes to this thing. Some of them are great. Some of them aren't. But I think at the end of the day, whether they hit or not, it's like I only put 10 minutes into it. But some like Dame or Marv, like I'll see some initially. And I'm generally, I try to be on top of everything. But I get so much stuff thrown at me that I got to take a step back. So I didn't see that for a couple hours. But as soon as I saw it, I thought I started thinking about House Party. And in my mind, it'll just start <laughs> turning into pop culture, like that rap battle from House Party. But then my mind moved to uh, Martin Lawrence's line when he played Bilal in it. And yeah. So I, so I initially saw that battle. I'm like, all right, everybody's kind of covered the battle. But in my mind, I'm like, what would happen if Lonzo got in there? And I start, start thinking about Belial and when he grabbed <laughs> the mic. And that's probably one of my favorite scenes, you know, from the movie, in addition to him yelling switch and all that. But just one of those, like, when I thought back as a kid, like, stuff would just pop in my head and I got to get it out. Like, uh, I was just talking to Snotty Dripping today. And I'm literally like, you know, because I put an out of pocket tweet up probably like 15, 20 minutes ago. And he's Carmella. like, yeah, and it's like if it pops in my head, I just gotta shoot it. Now a day before, because literally a day before, I love Melo and I want to see him win the Lakers. I want to see him win a ring. So a day before, I tweeted about that, and then I saw this thing this morning. I was like, oh, I gotta put this up. Like, like this is hilarious, you know. And when my mind just starts churning, it always just lands on what's the best caption I can come up with. Like if it's clowning, I'm a big LeBron fan. If it clowns whoever, I'm gonna have to clown LeBron sometimes. But I only do that because I know once LeBron wins again. Like, you know, it's going to be – a lot of people are going to block me and not want to hear me because I'm going to be going super hard. But in the <laughs> meantime, in between time, like, y'all, I'm an equal opportunity clowner. So if some, some pops in my head and I got to clown it, I just got to do it. I shoot it. I get a lot of, I get a lot of like, you're out-of-pocket responses all the time. Right. And, like, and I, I mean, I am. Like, look, I just, I just have a good time and crack up. But I'm more from the mentality of, like, I love and respect all those dudes in the league. Right, but right. it's like that, it's that, that locker room mentality. When you're in the locker room with your guys, like, you know, when I played at UCLA, we had, like, 10, 15 pros that I played with, but they were all equal in the locker room. We are just clowning. So anybody anybody would get clowned on anything, and it's no hard feeling. It's nothing personal. Like, people clown me all the time. It's like, you just, you know, I just take it and laugh about it. I don't try and take it too serious. But you got to fire. Shoot or shoot. That's what they say. Right. Now, I've seen you have to tell people, like, look, these are just jokes. And yeah. part, when I was thinking about the title for this podcast, I was like, man, it, I'm going to call it It's Just Jokes. Because yeah. at the end of the day, like, I see how you move and it's like, I understand it's for purposes of, of creating content and engagement and all that. But at the yeah. same point in time, it's like, like you alluded to when you're a part of that culture and when you're a part of that locker room culture and you just understand how it kind of goes, yeah. you're not really trying to be personal. It's just more like, I got to get the, I got to get this off. It came yeah. in my mind. I got to get this off. So every time, every time I see you do it, I never think it's out of pocket. I always just think it's just, it's part of the culture. I mean, look, um, I, I try to be out of pocket just to be real, just because, like what I've learned about comedy and everything is like you want to stand out, whether you're hooping or doing whatever. You want to do things. And this, this is just my nature. Like I've grown up in environments. I went to Crenshaw High School. I went to a school called Montclair Prep in the Valley. So I've seen both yep. worlds. But we clown. Like it don't matter where you're at, public school, private school, UCLA, whoever, summer league teams. Like dudes, dudes like to joke around and clown around. We like to entertain ourselves. And I think that's what kind of the NBA Twitter community has become an extension of just that culture. Like when we're watching a game now, look, there's tons of people that are going to give you like the stats and the analytics and all that great stuff. And believe right. me, I love all that stuff. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a true hooper and love all that. But it's like, look, enough for all that. I want to just joke around, man. I'm like, like I'm, you know, I'm old now. I don't, I'm not going to get out and play no games or do whatever. I just right. want to entertain, especially with the way the world's going now. There's so much, so much negativity and so much negative stuff going on in the world that I think that's why I love NBA Twitter. We can all come together and just clown around have a good time. I don't really try and get into much of the debates and arguments. It's right. like, I, I did that when I was younger. Like you spend hours and hours arguing Kobe, LeBron, ready to fight dudes, ready to drive to wherever they're at. Just it's like, <laughs> wait a minute. Like, you know, I remember that, that whole thing with Snotty. Snotty, uh, yeah. And yeah. it's like, 
he hates every time people bring it up. But to me, that was like that really put NBA Twitter on the map in terms of just like how passionate, how serious we are as a community. But I think right. it also opened a lot of people's eyes like, yo, just chill out. Like it's just jokes, like whatever it is, like you, you like the Bulls and I like the Lakers or I like the whoever. Like it don't matter. Like, man, let's all just enjoy these things and have a good time. Right. And for the people and for the people who will ride or die for these teams, unless they're actually cutting a check with your name on it. Yeah. First of all, if they are, you're not on Twitter like that arguing. So unless they're cutting a check for you to be, you know, some sort of social commentary specialist on on Twitter or social media, it's really not even worth it. Because because I'll be honest with you, most of the people, when they say stuff online, on Twitter, especially, they're never going to say it to your face. Like if they yeah. saw you 20 minutes from now and you said, hey, I'm at so and so, so and so. There's no way unless they really just try to come at you like that. No, nah, it, would, it would be something completely different. That tone would change completely. And that's the thing, too. Like people people come at you crazy. And then it's like, look, I'm not I'm not opposed to offering anybody the fade. I mean, other than like Mike Tyson, there's like four to six people in the universe. You know, like, you know, I'm only going to offer faith people. I, I know I can win for sure, but I'm not I'm not opposed to any of that. But it's also like, come on, bro. Like, let's all like especially me. I'm like, I'm like six, eight, three, ten right now and dropping, trying to get slender. But it's like, do you really want that that situation? Because I feel like a lot of people, the way they talk on Twitter, they're not like that in real life. No. Like, so, don't, so don't let your tweets uh, write a check that your ass can't cash. Because right. at some point, and what I have to do, I've had to deal with an NBA Twitter circle. Dudes coming at me crazy and sideways. It's like at some point we're gonna cross paths, and only right. one of us is gonna be afraid of get the, getting the shit slapped out of them. And it ain't gonna be me. Like you know, what I'm saying I don't want to do that. I'm a peaceful guy. I right. love you know, I love everybody. I try to just be cool. And, and let it slide. But a lot of times people try to make it personal. It's like, dude, don't say some shit that where you, if you get ran up on might be like, you ain't going to be able to talk your way out of it. It ain't going to be tweet time. You know what right. I mean? Like it's real life now. Like, so that's why I always just try to be mindful. Everybody I talk to too, man, just be respectful. Like we don't got to right. agree on stuff. You may have an opinion. I, I disagree with completely, but I'm not going to call you stupid or whatever, whatever. It's like, yeah, I just don't agree with that. Yeah. And I mean, at the end of the day, like you said, it is just an opinion. Even if yours is completely based, you know, in fact, at some point, an opinion, even based in fact, can become untrue. I, I, and look, I, I, the way I look at it is like this. If, if, if you're on social media to take life so serious, there's a lot of people on social media. They're not built for it. They're just yeah, not. Exactly. Like it's, it's, it's too personal to them. And it's like, dude, like, you know, you really can like turn this off, uninstall it. And your life is still, you know, fifteen dollars in the bank account. And you're still out here, you know, going yeah. to work nine to five every day. You realize this, right? Like, a, and I think I think a lot of people just forget that that digital shit's not as as serious as, as people try to make it out to be. Like I, I grew up literally. I've been I've been doing content for the better part of ten years now. Back in the old school YouTube days, when people would you know wish AIDS on your mom or like you know right. threaten, threaten to kill you and just and it's like I, it becomes so desensitized to it that literally I've had to take a step back even in, in recent times because it's like you got these young kids now that don't understand the rules and regulations of the Ooh. game. So they really want to come at you crazy. And it's like, bro, I don't care if you're 16 or whatever. Like, I will hunt. Like, these dudes don't understand. Like, they'll come crazy. I mean, I will literally hunt them down and know their info. Like, I know your home address. Like, I figured I'll put pieces together. Like, you know what I mean? So if you really want to go there, like, you don't want to do that. Like, you know, so right. let's, just be, let's just be cool about it because I don't want to go to that level. Like, I got a family. I have kids. I'm not trying to get, I'm not trying to, you know, stoop to that level. But, right. you know, when people come at me, I do my research. I make sure I know who I'm going up against and what they're yeah. capable of. Always. So, and, and there's a lot of people that aren't capable of the way they act on, on Twitter. So, and, and people don't always realize how much they put out on Twitter. Like it, it, it's really nothing but a couple searches on Twitter yeah. and you can find out a lot of things about a lot of people. And once you start sending out 5,000, 10,000, 15,000, a hundred thousand tweets, those things are hard to delete and match. Yeah, exactly. And it's like, everybody's only like, it's like everybody talks about six degrees of Kevin Bacon. Like you, you six DMs away from me finding out your location. Like, there's five or six people I can hit up, like, yo, do you know such and such? And, you know, through detective work, be like, oh, yeah, that's whoever. Like, yeah, I know, you know. And it's like, look, I don't want to get to that point, but sometimes people right. people get out of line with how they come at you. And it's like, dude, this is like, this is real life. Like, when y'all coming at me this crazy, like, you potentially taking food off my table. Like, you know, right. this, is, this is this is real life. Like, you don't want to really step into this shit if you're not about it. Well, and the other thing is people forget that Twitter is the detective social network. Like yeah. that's where everybody goes. Like, if we want to find this racist person that just yeah. you know did this video, twenty minutes later, somebody's done all the detective work. Yeah, like I'm looking at the stuff cracking with Little Nas X today with his like old account. It's like, especially when you're on and popping. Like, there's people that lived. You know, you see see it every year during the draft. I remember like Dante Divincenzo last year had a bunch right. of like it wasn't like racist stuff, but he was just talking crazy. I think about getting like his buddy and whatever. Like, just 
just crazy absurd stuff. But like people will hunt down your tweets and find whatever they can to, you know, to spark controversy and make you look like a bad person. So right. yeah, you got to be mindful of it. Look, I'm, I'm sure I got some stuff floating out there. I'm not really tripping. I live my life a little more carefree than that. But yeah. you know, at the end of the day, like I am mindful of the stuff I put out and make right. sure not to go too far with anything. Yeah. So speaking of all of that, I mean, this was a pretty meme worthy season this past NBA yeah. season. What do you think your favorite meme worthy moment was from this past season? Oh man. Uh, that's, that's honestly, there's so much. I think the thing that the, the video that really performed for me, I want to say this, this happened in the preseason was a Laker game. LeBron was looking at the stat sheet. So I did this voiceover video live of it. Basically just all the people, cause like the AD stuff's been going on. I want to say since last summer, but it's basically just LeBron looking at the roster saying all the people he was going to trade. Right. And jo Josh Hart was sitting right next to him. That, that was a favorite of mine. And another one from the NFL space was uh, Kodak Black came to Lamar Jackson's, uh, I think, playoff game. And that's right around when that, that Kodak, I hope so, uh, thing thing was going. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, with the breakfast club. Yeah, yeah. So I saw so I, I, I saw the video of Lamar. I think the Ravens had posted it. So I grabbed that real quick and just inserted the uh, the, the hope so track into it. And that <laughs> this stuff, like, like, I do this stuff so much. I just, like I said, I see things and I just got to put it out. I don't care if it hits or not. Ultimately, if it makes me crack up, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'll ask my fiance what she thinks. If she gives me the, the seal of approval, then if we both agree, I think, you know, we're both two intelligent people, I'll drop it. Sometimes right. it hits, sometimes it don't. But I think anything that makes me giggle, that's when I'm like, oh, I got to put this up. Like, the, the mellow one I put up to the way, as soon as I saw the tweet, I was trying to formulate it in my head. Then I came up with what I tweeted. I'm like, oh, man, this is, you know, I don't know if people are going to like this, but this made me crack up. Yeah, the uh, the the Carmelo tweet. They, I mean, they straight started taking those jeans off that girl and just starting smacking the absolute dog shit out of her. And I'm like, man, that caption just works so, so well. I saw that just just before uh, just before we got on here, and I was like, man. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, it, it's funny because, like, you know, like I said, it's just that quick wittedness to try to see something and be able to just do it right away. Exactly. And, and you you figured out a way to do it in a way where. You know, it combines a lot of the ways in which you've grown up and what you've gone, you know, what you've gone through culturally. But then also at the same time, it's it's a it's a it's a melting pot. So your voice can be very authentic because at the end of the day, like, you know, what you're doing, the content you're providing is really stuff that you would you would more than likely be putting out there amongst your friends and amongst other people. Exactly. Anyway, it's just it's giving you what you've just got, got a digital footprint to where more people can find out, you know, how funny and and how quick with it you are. Exactly. Honestly, man, I work in the entertainment industry. So especially as a writer, like I always just need to keep my brain flowing. So these are always just like puzzles for me. Like, let me see how much good content I can put out. And the thing about working in the entertainment industry, sometimes you have a lot of ideas that you got to pitch to execs or pitch through these channels and they might not be able to relate to what you're saying. So they may shit on your idea or knock it or we're not rolling with it. Look, that is what it is. But when I like about Twitter, social, especially is like if I have an idea, I can drop it and I'll get a response right away of how people are feeling about it. You know what I mean? I'll see right away if people gravitate toward it if they're on the same wavelength as me thinking about stuff. So really for me, it's just a way to keep my mind fresh for all the other like professional work that I do when I'm writing scripts and stuff. It's always just problem solving to figure out, you know, putting the jokes in, putting the funniest joke in, staying on top of everything that's cracking in pop culture. And I'm also, I'm just a huge sports fan, but it didn't always used to be like that. Like when, like five, six years ago, I'd be on group chats with people and they'd be dropping all these memes and stuff. And my head would be spinning like, I don't get where you're getting all this stuff from. But that's really, I started like my boys literally my boys like booted me out of a group chat because they would they would drop all this stuff and like they just had all this stuff at their disposal. I'm like, damn, I don't even know what's going on. But as I slowly started really immersing in the world, it's like, oh man, this is literally like because I'm a pop culture fiend. I literally was raised by television, so I got so many just movies and and things. And it's funny, I'm actually dropping a I'm dropping a video next Saturday to start a free agency. That I really think feels gonna cook, but it's just based off some pop culture stuff. And it's right. like when this stuff pops in my head, I'm just like, oh man, I gotta like, like this thing, you know, it just like makes me smile. And I'll literally, it's basically a song I'm dropping that's based off of a pop culture song. But uh, literally, the lyrics just literally like they, they write themselves. Like honestly, because I'm so used to doing all this stuff. So I yeah. think I, I even look at the community and everybody. I feel especially now, like more people have kind of jumped into the world where they're putting out funny stuff. And to me, it's like I didn't realize how many people were so hilarious. And I love NBA Twitter for just giving people an outlet to be able to do that stuff and really show who, what their character is. You get these like serious dudes who you think are serious in real life that start cracking jokes and dropping memes. So I'm like, oh man, okay, oh, I gotta step <laughs> my game up. Like, oh, I gotta, you know, okay, I see y'all coming for the throne. Like, let me, yeah. let me, you know, let me really step my game up. So I just love like it's like a healthy competition amongst everybody, but literally just like 
this comedy, like endless entertainment, like it coming from everywhere. I mean, I really, I really just enjoy it. So one of the things that um, social media has highlighted on top of memes, really, which is in, in, in the sport of basketball, is bench celebrations. You see a lot of it with Worldwide Wob, and you, you see it with other people as well, you know, especially around March Madness or even college basketball season. If you were to come up with a bench celebration for a game winner, who would be on the bench with you celebrating? You can pick anybody you want. And what celebration do you think y'all would come up with? Oh man, if we were trying, I remember like Mammoth, Mammoth had the celebrations cracking a few years ago. I'd say we'd have to do some real elaborate stuff. I'm trying to think like, I mean, I love like Dragonfly Jones. I always say like Dragonfly Jones, like LeJethro Jenkins, that whole crew, like those dudes really inspire me along with like Amin and Bomani to, to really get in this thing. So it really have to be, I mean, some dudes on that wavelength that are just super hilarious. And I mean, in terms of celebration, I don't even know. I mean, we probably have to go. I don't even, you know, whatever we would do, like even some set it off type stuff or some stomp the yard, like literally just super elaborate. You're not gonna be out there trying to do the worm at six eight three ten, are you? No, nah, I, I, <laughs> I could do like a mediocre worm probably like 15 years ago. I could never get the full extension. Yeah, but I, that didn't stop me from trying. I don't, I don't think I, I'm too stiff, man. I don't have uh, my body's yeah. not loose enough to do. You got yoga body. for about six months before you yeah. do that. Huh? <laughs> for sure. Like I remember when I was hooping, like people just started doing yoga. This was like early 2000s. And we were looking at it like, yeah, what y'all doing, bro? But now I look at these guys and how much they put into their body. And it's like, you see why these dudes, like, this is like the, the renaissance for basketball, like the, the best time to watch professional hoops, man. These dudes, they play hundreds of games a year. They play all season. I'm watching, like, Drew League highlights. Dudes, you know, league dudes can't wait to go play in the summertime. But they just stay so so nimble and flexible, especially a dude like LeBron, who's like, what, year 17? Right. Still – you know, still looking like, you know, he, he's starting to he's starting to show some rust, but still like, wow, bro. You know, 20 years yeah. ago, if he'd have been in year 17, he'd been walking around with a cane, like, you know what I'm saying? Not doing any, anything he's doing now. Uh, he, yeah, no, for sure. He, he would have needed a wheelchair, unlike Paul Pierce. Um, <laughs> to go yeah, drop yeah. Some heat. <laughs> hey, so you once said uh, in an interview, uh, that, you know, while you're on the bench, because, you know, as, as you like to point out, you know, you, you were a bench former at UCLA. So yeah. you may be on the bench two, three hours and, you know, you've got to be able to figure out a way to entertain yourself, whether it's through stories, talking about life with your, with, with your teammates. And then you also mentioned, you know, basically shooting your shot at girls in the crowd. Is there a funny story of a time where you shot your shot from the bench that you can share, whether it went um, left or whether it went right? Uh, probably. So look, like I played in the Pac-12. So you had like Arizona's cheerleaders, Oregon's cheerleaders. I think it was one of those one of those two venues. I don't know what was cracking, but I remember literally like I was just staring at like one of the cheerleaders way too hard, and she caught me reckless eyeballing, and literally just gave me like the "What are you doing?" I'm like, "Oh damn, my bad." Like, <laughs> 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 but that it was just because literally like yeah, you would just zone out during these games. So I would just start looking and stuff like whatever, looking around the crowd doing whatever. But I remember honestly like. Never, like, you know, you would get, like, dudes in the crowd talking stuff. So we would do this thing where, like, if, if a guy was with his girl and he was talking shit to you, we wouldn't even acknowledge the guy. We would just start looking at the girl and, like, hollering at her, literally just to, just to like, to piss off the, oppos the opposing fan. Like, they, the dudes used to hate that shit, especially if it was, like, crap boys or something. They'd be like, oh, you suck, Johnson, whatever, whatever. I'm like, I'm not even looking at you, bro. Like, what's up, girl? You know what I'm saying? Like, oh, we're Facebook, like. <laughs> But so we would always just like we make a game out of that type of stuff. And I, I was able to play with a lot of good guys, too, who like sometimes I remember literally like I played with Jason Capono and uh, we were playing at Stanford and his girlfriend was at the game and the crowd started chanting some crazy shit at his girl. Aww. And it's, I'm just literally looking like, bro, y'all don't want to like don't, not to Capono, dog. Like he's not the one like he's the black <laughs> and white dude I've ever like, you know, like, Capone's the blackest white dude I've ever been around. Like, so we heard that. I think he literally went, like, for, like, 30, whatever. It was just, like, uh -oh. it was done he was like, bro, y'all don't know who y'all are messing with, bro. That's not, like, that's not a good idea. And I remember <laughs> we're on, like, pregame warm-up stretch, and they started chanting at his boo. And I'm just looking at him, and he's getting hot. I'm like, oh, damn, Capone's about to go off on these dudes, bro. <laughs> um, Kind of going away from that, but staying with, you know, with the humor and you talked about, you know, the writing room earlier and, and I've seen you mention it on Twitter before. And you actually uh, I've seen you mention to somebody before, you know, if you think, you know, the tweets are funny, you should be in a writing room with me. Yeah. Um, take me into a writer's room with you and describe what that's like and what that creative space is for you and how that kind of unlocks some additional humor or, or another side to you that maybe we don't get to see on on Twitter. I mean, like a writer's room generally, like especially like Legend of Chamber Heights, which is a show uh, I was a creator on on Comedy Central. 
we had so many just intelligent human beings in there. So much elevated conversation, like like me and my buddy Quinn Hawking, who was also a creator on the show. We played at UCLA together. So we kind of brought that locker room culture. But then we had dudes like Carl Jones, who's literally one of the most talented, incredible human beings. He's got a show called Sugar and Toys, now on Fuse TV. Michael Starberry, who literally has comedy and drama on lock. He, he wrote uh, the, the finale episode of When They See Us with Ava DuVernay, which okay. he, he, he about to win an Emmy. But, but you get dudes like... You know, dudes like that. We had Devon Shepard, who was our showrunner, who'd been in the game for like 20 years. We had a bunch of talented uh, female comedians like Zaneb Johnson, Amanda Seals, and other people through there. Right. It's just like, you know, it's, it's like a healthy competition. It's kind of like Twitter, like literally who got the best joke, like best right. jokes getting in the script. The thing about writing scripts and, and formulating things is like when you write a script out, you'll have a joke in there. You know, you can go back and try to beat whatever joke you have in the script. Like, right. you know, the same thing with like, same thing with like a meme drops on Twitter and a hundred people are trying to put their best caption on it. Like that's yep. what a writer's room is like nonstop, but literally like healthy. Like somebody may come in like, oh, I got a great idea for this. Like like Carl Carl would come in like, you know, we should try this or try that. Or we had, a, I don't know how familiar you are with the show, but we had an episode where- Yeah, uh, I am. It's called Tupac, we were where Tupac yeah. came back. So <laughs> I literally remember the day that Carl pitched that in the room, cause we were like pitching ideas. He kind of just pulled that one out. He got this like notebook full of ideas. He's like, yeah, man. I want to do one as like uh, Tupac comes back as a, a cross dressing stripper with a fat ass, but they don't really know if it's Tupac or not. And it literally like the whole room just like lights up. Like, and it's kind of the same thing with Twitter. Like where a tweet may go viral and get thousands of retweets. And that's how you know that it's embraced. Like in a writer's room, you can make the whole room crack up. Right. On a joke. And you put it in like we had, and that's like working on that show was honestly some of the best times of my life. Cause you knew every day coming into work, you were going to be cracking up. Like, you know, even if we had like a 12 hour day, it was 12 hours of dudes cracking jokes. So ultimately, like, how hard can that be? That's like the best job on earth. But so that's where, that's where like, even with the Twitter stuff now, I always look at it like, man, I got to put out as many good, much good content as possible. I'm going up against a million people who are just, you know, are creative, artistic, talented. And it's like, the thing about Twitter is like, if it's good content, it's good content. No matter how big your following is, you could have one follower out, put a great tweet out. And that thing can get hundreds of thousands of tweets just because right. people relate and bond with that type of stuff. So I always just for my, myself, just try to stay in that conversation as much as possible. And like we were talking about earlier, like if it's something topical, I just try to jump in and really be ready. Like I feel like a lot of people have like stuff ready to go. I'm more like just whatever happens, I react to it, which may, you know it helps and hurts a lot. Like I miss a lot of stuff, but then there's other times yeah. I'll see some, like some will pop in my head or I'll remember something I did. It's crazy. Like I, I've had so much good stuff over the past like two years. I'll forget tweets, and people will like like them or retweet them. I'm like, oh damn, I did, I did tweet that. Yeah, right. And it's but it's, you know, so I just try to. I love like whether it's a writer's room or Twitter. Just really like I love just the, the the environment of trying to be funny and knowing that no matter what, if it's funny, people are gonna laugh. If it's not, they're gonna call you out on your shit, and you just gotta chalk it up, take your L, come back again with something better next time. You know. Yeah. Right. Um. You know, you you you've mentioned the process of of going throughout you know writing a script and being in the writer's room but you know there's a lot of people out here especially where you're at in in, in la and just in, in general who want to get in the entertainment business who want to you know create a show get it on a network talk about kind of that process a little bit because i you know i don't know the extent of your experience prior to legends of chamberlain heights but you know talk about the process of being able to come up with the idea for the show and then getting it on the network and then what have you learned since then that's really helped you in, in projects you're working on now I mean, one of the things I really, especially like since the passing of Nipsey and, and just watching a lot of his stuff is like, you got to be relentless. Like the entertainment industry doesn't give a shit about you. They'll forget about you quickly. So you got to be on your game, always coming with heat and be ready for rejection. Like, you know, like it's all a numbers game. So the goal with any project is to pitch it to as many people as possible to get more right. yeses and noes. Like inevitably in this on this side, you're going to get tons of noes because you're dealing with literally networks that, that hear, you know, hundreds of pitches every year and pick 15 shows. So you're competing up against every, all the top talented writers and creators in Hollywood, all the up and coming people. It's, it's just like the league. Like, like how do you sustain? Like, you know, it's like a lot of people now is like, don't come in trying to be Steph when you can come in and be like a strong defender or a rebounder. And that's how you're going to get in the league. Like everybody, every team don't need a LeBron type. Some teams need a Udonis Haslam or, you know, a Ray Allen or whoever. So really just kind of figuring out what your lane is and how, how you're able to accomplish that. But I think the main thing is just like, don't quit. Like, it's going to be a lot of times. I always tell people like Legends of Chamberlain Heights, that show didn't go, go on TV till 2016. We started working on that show in 2009. So that wow. was a, 
a seven, you know what I mean? Everybody sees the end result, like, oh, man, right, y'all right. made it. This was overnight. Like, bro, this is like 2009, bro. I was in my 20s, like, young, getting right. in, like, oh, I'm about to have a TV show. Like, oh, look at me. And the show didn't air until I was in my, you know, early 30s. And it's like, by that point, I'm, I become more seasoned as a man, more hardened. And it's like, yo, like, is this ever going to happen? But it's always just staying relentless and keeping, even now that that show's gone, like, I've been, I'm fortunate to work on other projects and do stuff, but it's always just trying to stay relentless as possible and not giving up. Because, like, I always tell people, like, if you quit, nobody's going to care. We all got our own shit to worry about. We all got our bills to pay, lives, lives to take care of, you know, kids, families, whatever. So you quit, nobody's going to stop. Like, Hollywood's not going to stop. Be like, oh, damn, Josiah quit. Like, you know, let's take, you know, a week off in remembrance. Like, no, like, it's still going to be. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's still gonna be shit getting put out. So that's even for me who's created stuff and done stuff. So even for people that are that are aspiring or trying to get in, it's like, look, you're gonna get a lot of no's. Like more no's, like me telling you you're gonna get a lot of no's. You're gonna think like, oh, okay, what's a lot of no's? Like you're gonna find a out a lot of no's. It's gonna be past that that point of no's right. that you were expecting was a lot. Like, oh damn, it's more than this. Like, yeah, motherfucker, it's it's even more. You're gonna get a lot of those no's, but all it takes is that one yes. Like we pitched, we pitched legends to like four or five different networks. Comedy Central is the only one who said yes. We went one for five. Like, you shoot that in the game, like, you ain't going to last long in the league, right? Nah. You shoot, you shoot that in the entertainment industry, bro. You, you, you're literally Jordan or, or Kareem or LeBron. Like, you right. know, going, going one for five in entertainment is like, oh, okay. Like, you can make a, a great living for yourself. So it's really just not being, not being, it's, you know, people come to, to Hollywood, especially they think like, oh, man, I'm just going to write this script. I wrote a script. It's like, who gives a fuck? Like, I wrote a script. People tell me, I don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? It's like, who gives a fuck? Like, now go sell your script. Go be passionate about it. And it's like the squeaky wheel gets the oil. So, literally, you got to be out there promoting, selling yourself, grinding, doing a lot of shit that may not feel comfortable, bothering the shit out of a lot of people. But like I say, like, if you bother somebody with a hot product, you're not bothering them. You're doing them a favor. That's how I always look at whatever I'm doing. Like, if I come to you some of the heat, whether you want it or not, like, I just did you a favor and presented you an opportunity. So, you really just got to have a strong belief in yourself and also willingness and determination to constantly just go out there and get it. Yeah, no doubt. Um, transitioning from that, um, obviously, as we've talked about, and as you mentioned, is that anybody who follows you or knows anything about you knows that obviously you played at UCLA. But one of the things that I didn't know prior to researching you is that at one point you were a ball boy for the 95 national champions. Yep. Um, Damn, bro, you just, okay, you know, extensive research. Okay, I'll see you all I don't here. know about extensive. Listen, I don't know about extensive, but, I, but, but like, you we know. We this thing around in like four or five days. So I think it was like you hit me like four or five days ago. So even, you know, I just always appreciate because just to, to bounce back to entertainment real quick, like whenever I'm going to interview with somebody, I always research the fuck out of them and do scouting yeah. reports. I literally put like scouting reports, like these are the shows they worked on. This is what they like. But just to, so when, when people do that for me or ask me questions, I'm always like, yeah, okay, bro, like, let's get it. So, yeah, no. <laughs> but back to, back to, um, yeah, William, what was the question? I'm, I'm cut, cut no, you you're good. I appreciate that, by the way. Um, But what's a moment from that team? It could it doesn't have to be, obviously, you know, the national championship win or anything in the, in the tournament. What's a moment that you were present for that when I when I mentioned that, being a ball boy for the 95 national champions, that, that automatically pops into your mind? So first of all, my older brother, Chris, was a freshman on that squad. And he he gained – he was literally like – I want to say like the seventh man. They went with the six-man rotation. He ended up like hurting his foot. But he he was like killing early in the season. But he gained notoriety for like doing this thing with towels. Like he would do all these different – basically like rally caps with towels on the bench. So that, that, that was one vivid memory of mine because literally even like – you know, I was sitting like probably like 15 feet away from him. And no, as a hooper, like you hate to not be able to be out there contributing as much as you want. Right. But him finding a way to still shine and still help his team out, it became a whole big rally and cry with the squad. But what I always tell people, actually, you know, like ball boying on that that squad and seeing Ed O'Bannon, like Ed O'Bannon is one of my heroes. Like, and the people kind of like and later on in his life, like like shat on him because his career didn't really work out. But, but people don't really understand about Ed O'Bannon that season. Like Ed's knee was fucked up. Like Ed, like you know, and, and this is like the early '90s, back right. in those times, like. You know, if you suffered a torn ACL, I think he like tore his ACL, MCL. Yeah, PCL. knee injuries back then were bad. Like now, it's like, oh, okay, cool. You'll be yeah. out back after next season. Like back then, like it was at least two throw. years, and you were done. Right. Ed, for so Ed, I want to say coming into his freshman year at UCLA, did that. Literally, he was like the number one recruit in the country. So I got to see him his senior year after all that shit. And literally, after every game, he's getting his knee drained. Like just the, just the, and I really am convinced that Ed, Ed could have said, you know what, fuck, fuck UCLA. I'm just going to concentrate on getting ready for the league and had a much better NBA career. But Ed was such a loyal dude that he loved UCLA so much that he was like, nah, man, like, I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to play basketball. 
So I'm going to relish every moment and enjoy it and really try to win a national championship. And just to see him as a leader in a way, you know, like this dude would be crying in the locker room at halftime, yelling at dudes, getting in people's asses. Like, but also like if, if he, a random chance he was on a bench and like we were going to clean some shit during the game, he'd be like rooting us on, encouraging us. Like he was just like, if you had, if you were part of UCLA, you were family. So seeing Ed that entire season and just what he was able to accomplish, uh, winning a national championship, winning player of the year. It's like, for me, like, I will never forget that just like being around him. I remember literally one time random game, like he drove to the cup, got fouled, ended up like falling on the ground, but it was like a bad fall, but his like foot ended up landing like right on my head. Oh. But, but he was like, <laughs> he didn't move, but he was like on the ground, but didn't move for a second. I'm not moving. Like, Oh shit. We're all like, yeah. finally like lifts up and gets up. We're like, Oh damn. But I remember <laughs> having like Ed O'Bannon's big ass foot just like sitting on my head as a ball, but I'm like, oh, man, this is like, this is legendary. <laughs> like, this is one of the greatest experiences of my life. But I was also at the Natty game and actually uh, stayed in the room with my brother after they won. There was literally like 15 people in there. These yeah. dudes were going, I was probably, what, this is now, I was probably 13. These dudes were going hard all night. But for me, it was just like, man, I knew at that very moment, like, man, I want to go to UCLA, bro. Like, this, you know, I don't, I grew up there and obviously my dad played there too. So, right. But, just being being around that experience and seeing what a like a national championship team with the caliber of player you had to have because there was no even the worst dude on that bench would give you buckets like you know even the worst dude on that bench was was going hard and doing whatever and just to see that squad and the way they came together and being at the final four when Tyus went down and they're really thinking like yo there's no way UCLA can beat Arkansas they had you know the the, the press and all that other shit and to see them bust Corliss Williamson and Scotty Thurman and that crew. Yeah. Dickie Dillard, like, you know, I still remember that's one of my favorite teams, Nolan Richardson coaching, to right. see without Tyus. Yeah, exactly. 40 minutes of hell without Tyus, Cameron Dollar stepping up and right. dropping like 31 to 17, whatever he did. Toby, I think, went like 26 and 6. Like, right. but just to be around that crew and have a brother on there and be like, I'm still like, the way that I look at those dudes, like, those dudes are my heroes. So even right. still, but those, honestly, those moments I'll never forget. Like, I carry with me everywhere. Like, it's like, still think back now to this day, it's the last team to win a natty in UCLA history, and I got to be a part of it in some small way. So you obviously you mentioned your dad um, in, in, in your previous answer. And now, for those who don't know, uh, your dad played a role in White Man Can't Jump. My, yeah. listen, there's a lot of basketball movies that exist. If there's yeah. one basketball movie for me that can't, that, that is all of them were removed, that I have to make sure it stays in existence, only one is White Man Can't Jump. Yeah. Woody Harrelson catching the alley oop at the end as a white guy who couldn't jump. It, it just, it just, you know, it, 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 it sits with me. Um, so obviously, you know, for those who don't know, your dad played Raymond in that movie. I, one of my favorite scenes in the entire movie. Yeah. Um, what do you remember about that time? Cause you would have been about what, 10 years old around when yeah. that movie came out. So now I remember, I remember when I first read the script, he used, to, he used to be doing a lot of acting at that point. He used to bring scripts home. And he, I think, initially tried to read for the role of Wesley Snipes. So I was reading, like, Woody's character with him back and forth. And then, obviously, uh, Wesley Snipes ended up getting the role. They're like, we got this other role for you. So what I remember about that, and this was, like, he had ended up, like, his career tragically ended, uh, I want to say, like, 86, 87. He had broke his neck, tried to come back with the Warriors, uh, 89, 90, played, like, 10 games with them, ended up going over to Italy playing a little bit. But, like, by April of 90, like, his career was done. So right. he was really going heavy. He had, he had been a theater arts major in college and was super into like acting and stuff. So he was going super hard on it, but he brought the script home. I remember reading it with him. And then I remember like, so in order to get into that character of Raymond, he didn't shave for literally yeah. like weeks. So he right. had this, but he walked it's around a, the house. Listen, it don't even look like him. Yeah, exactly. But he walked around the house with this like scruffy beard and whatever, and just be method acting in character all the time. So I remember like going on set, seeing all that stuff, like hanging with Woody and Wesley. And then being at the premiere, and because I, you know, you, you know, I, I didn't know, you know, I'd be on the set, but I know what was going on. Being at the right. premiere, seeing his scene for the first time, and just how the whole theater erupted when he did like the, no, right. no, this ain't Raymond, no. yeah. but, which I, which literally I don't think was even in the script. He kind of just ad libbed that, and they loved Rosh wow. it so much. But so just seeing, you know, seeing that, and just how everybody reacted to him, it's like, damn, this might, you know, this this might do something. Like, and then just see even now. I tell people he was a five-time All-Star, literally like college right. player of the year, and nobody knows any of that. All they know is him as Raymond from White Man right, Can't Jump. Right, but, right. but but it's like, look, you know, he relishes that. But it's just like the younger generation, the kids. He would go speak at camps, and it's like, you know, they're giving him. I'm gonna get my other gun line, but literally don't know that he, you know, he was a five-time All-Star. So right, like, it was an actual Hooper. 
Exactly. So, but just to see the way that movie, and the funny thing about that movie, it's literally a rom com. It's not even. It's a quote unquote basketball movie. Yeah, basically. But right. It's but it's a rom. You know, which which Ron Sheldon always did with like Bull Durham and other movies. Like it's a rom com with with basketball as a spine. So to see how amazing, because that's all we all think of it. Like I'm not even really worried about the uh, the Billy and Gloria stuff. It's all just like you know. Right, him, I want to go to the hoop scenes. Yeah, exactly. That's him how I was too. <laughs> like, That's how I was too growing up. Like man, just get back to like just get get me to like Flight and Willie. That's all I want to see. I want to see Flight and Willie throwing it off the backboard. I want to see I want to see Dwayne Martin throwing it off the backboard. That's so all I, I wanted to see. I used to go like they would do like these. So before the movie started, they would do like these these workouts with the whole crew. Yeah. And like Woody Harrelson. Wasn't really the best hooper. Like, I mean, excuse me, uh, Wesley, Woody Harrison didn't actually hoop, I want to say, like a D3. So he had some game. But, like, Wesley Snipes wasn't really, like, he, he was kind of nasty out there to just <laughs> even see the way that they put the scenes together and make him look like he was actually a proficient basketball player. It's well, literally you, movie magic. You know what's funny about Wesley? Uh, one of the things I, I've heard or read, even when he played, um, I forget his character, uh, Willie Mays Hayes, when he played uh, yeah. what was it, what, Major League. Major League, yeah. They, you know, in order to make him look really fast, they said that they had to slow the camera down, you know, put him in slow-mo every time to make it look like he was moving really fast. Yeah. So it's kind of funny that you mentioned, you know, everybody likes to think that he's like this this uber athlete because the roles he's played in the actuality, somebody's really just trying to make him look good. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's where, like, you know, it, but even in White Man Can't Jump, you see the tight scenes where be body doubles doing all the whatever. But yeah. you to his face acting like, you know, and it's like you get tricked into thinking, like, oh, man, this dude can hoop. But I just always thought that was hilarious. Like, as a kid, seeing that, be like, damn, he's kind of he's kind of trash, but whatever. Like, he's Wesley Snipes, so it's literally like, oh, man, that's one of the greatest actors ever. Sure. No doubt. Um, it, we've talked a lot about, you know, your life in entertainment and sport. If you had to go away from that and, and start focusing on other areas, other industries, where do you think you would, where do you think you would go and, and what would you do? Honestly, man, I would have probably gone into, like, investment banking or something like that that just really makes a ton of bread. Like, you know what I mean? Like, at the end of the day, like, you know, I like Gucci loafers. I like having nice things. So if I couldn't, <laughs> if I couldn't be sport or entertainment using my creativity, it would definitely be something in the square sector, like, you know, playing the stock market or doing some, something like that, some, you know, some boiler room type shit. <laughs> <laughs> you, uh, you'd be a wolf of Wall Street maybe? You know, not now. I'm, I'm. I like to sleep at night, so I don't really like ganging people like that. I would do it. I would be the guy on the other side who's doing it the right way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, a follow up question to that. You know, we we've seen Jordan Peele transition from comedy into a horror genre successfully. You know, if you were to create a show outside of 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 um comedy, you know, where what do you think the genre would be that you would go towards, and what do you think the premise of that show would be? Ooh, that's a good question. I mean, I have. I actually got some stuff that's more more dramatic. Like uh, I'm working with my pops on a show about uh, gentrification. I grew up in this neighborhood called View Park, which is literally one of the uh, most affluent African American neighborhoods in the country. Like Easter Ray is from there. Like a lot of you know talented people, like Reggie Theus used to live right down the street from us. Like sure. Uncle Reggie. Uh, but just now, like it, it literally used to be a black stronghold that used to turn over from family to family. And now with the, like the, the advent of Silicon Beach. And a lot of industries coming over in that area. A lot of kind of white people now have come back to the neighborhood and are not necessarily pushing out, but it's right. really like, you know, you're just seeing kind of what the gentrification is right. firsthand. Like, literally, like, like I grew up, like, you know, right right near Nip Nipsey's shop on Crenshaw and Slauson. Right. And, you know, nowadays you'll see like white people walking down Crenshaw and Slauson just like, and it's yeah. like, well, I'm always, I'm always taken aback by it. Like, damn, like, you know, back in the days, it would literally be a thing. Like, if I was with my pops and we saw that, he would, like, pull over and be like, yo, like, just let you know, like. You might want to get. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. might want to hit down Crenshaw and really get, get, you know, past the 10 and, you know, whatever, you know, just to let you know. Where now, right. like, I see, like, random, like, Swedish families with the fanny packs, like, <laughs> at the bus stop on Crenshaw <laughs> Slauson or Crenshaw Stocker. And I'm just like, damn, like, they, they got a lot of gall. But it's also indicative of just how the community's changing. Like, you know, it, I think it being more embracing and, and opening. And it's one of the areas that I remember I used to take Uber uh, back when I lived. I was, I was staying at home for a little bit, probably like six, seven years ago. And I would take the Uber and get dropped off. And they'd just be like, damn, man, where is this? Like, I never even heard of this. Like, wow. Like, you know what I mean? And it's like, then now it's like, oh, now you heard of it. Like, everybody is a motherfucker now. Like, like the, the cat is out the bag. So that's the show I've been developing. I mean, I look at Peel. He's kind of one of my inspirations. I know he had Get Out for like eight to ten years before he actually got sure. it made. 
and I'm sure he'd be pitching to people and they'd be like, oh, well, no, nah, bro, you're a comedian. Like, you can't do, you right. can't do this shit. Like, how, how you know, like, you're, you're a funny guy. Stick to that. And I think it's just a, a sign of, like, look, like, no matter what, it's like, I always tell people, like, my, you look at my Twitter and people are like, oh, you're the voiceover guy. It's like, bro, I, like, I produce TV shows. Like, like that's what I do for a living. Like, Twitter, right. like, I just do Twitter for fun just to stay entertained. But everybody now sees all, all the stuff that's been more visible on Twitter. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, nah, bro, my bread and butter is literally, like, I EP, supervise and produce, you know, television shows, digital shows, a bunch of shit. that if you saw me in my normal square work environment, you'd be like, damn, who the, like, who the fuck is this guy? It, right. would look like, it would look like some get out shit, just to be real. Right. Like, damn, <laughs> like, you know, you see me in a pitch meeting or whatever, like, oh, wow, like, I didn't, I, it's the same guy that does these, like, funny dick and fart jokes on Twitter. <laughs> so, yeah, I no. mean. Well, um, what is it? I mean, you, and you and you kind of alluded to it. What what is it really like to to make to try to make that transition to get people to take you seriously when you say, "Listen, I want I want to do a documentary on my neighborhood about the gentrification process that's taking place," yeah. and yet people are, are you know know you from the dick and fart jokes. Now, how hard is it to get people to really like turn that off and see you for, "Hey, this, I really want to take this passion project on and, and make people aware." I think I think it's tough, but it's also from the standpoint of like, look, like I, I went to UCLA. I got a good education. I was literally like fucking honor student in, in, in high school, had like a four point three GPA. So I, I've always like my mom was a teacher, like my dad's whole family's educators. I've always took education super seriously. So when you sit down with me, you're not going to get like because even like coming out of UCLA, it was like, oh, man, you're just a big, dumb athlete. Like you should just want to play basketball. You shouldn't have any other aspirations. It's right. like, no, nah, motherfucker, I got, I got a lot of levels and layers to this shit that we got to peel back. So I think even just, I, I understand when I go and take meetings and do stuff like that, or my pitching idea, that may be how I'm looked at, but it's really just to show people. Because once I start hitting you with numbers and stats and info, and it's like, oh, damn, this motherfucker, like, Prepare. like he knows, yeah, he knows what he's talking Kind of similar, like, to you coming in this interview, like, I'm going to do my research, whoever I'm dealing with, like, I already right. know, you know. I know what their favorite food is, what time they go to bed, like what their, <laughs> their pet's name was when they were a little kid, like every show they worked on, who they work with. You know, yeah. so I, I just try to like, I look past all that because you never want to get, like I, I'm good friends with Jaleel White, uh, just through like the UCLA yeah. connection. I, and listen, then, family matters was my shit when I was yeah. growing up. And the thing is, he got so typecast into being uh, the Steve Urkel character. Steve Urkel, right. He's really one of the most brilliant, like one of the best writers I've seen, just like, you know, brilliant director, like, just a human being where you would only look at him like, oh, damn, you just Steve Urkel. Just make the nerd voice. Right. But really, once you get to talk to him, and I'm like, damn, this dude is fucking like, you know, some whole other, like, whole other wavelength. And it's literally because he was immersed in that whole world. Like, when yeah. you're an actor, like, whether, whatever side of the camera, you got to learn how to do all that other shit. Like, as a writer, I got to know how to direct. I got to know how to act so that I can put all these things, like being a head coach or being right. like on, on a hoop squad. I need to know. If I'm running a play, I need to know what everybody else is doing in the play, too. So right. I don't just need to know my position. I need to know every single position to make right. this play work effective so I can tell the three, like, no, nah, you're supposed to be here. Or tell right. the point guard, like, oh, you're supposed to do that. Like, you know, let the point mm-hmm. guard handle that, but also know, like, I got to know what he's thinking. Yeah. He wants me to cut or whatever. And that's where, like, you see, like, teams like the Warriors or, like, LeBron type of squads, when people are all bought in like that and know everything that's going on, it's like, don't just know yeah. your position. You got to know everything. So that's what I always just try to – try to take with it and when I'm coming and pitching something just really you know just kind of showcase that and don't get I mean it's like you could talk to me for a couple minutes and realize all right this ain't this, he's not just some dumb fuck like he knows what he's talking about right so look I you know I can't do this show and this interview with you without asking a few legends questions and a really good friend of mine you know I I enjoyed watching boondocks you know when it was out and yeah. for a long time I was searching for a replacement to try to figure out I had a good friend of mine, Russ Wood, who who uh, we, we would sit there and we would watch, you know, Boondock and we'd talk about it. And then when the show went off the air, like we need a replacement. Yeah. And he came to me one day. He's like, man, if you watch this show, Legends of Chamberlain Heights. So I was like, I was sitting there thinking, honestly, when I heard the name, I'm sitting there thinking, did somebody make a show about the exploits of Wilt Chamberlain? Yeah. Like I'm thinking like, like it's going to be some shit about that. I started watching it and we'd start talking about it like we did with Boondocks. So I, I reached out to Russ and I was like, man, hey, listen, I'm having Josiah on the show. I said, you know, what question do you want to know? So this question is actually coming from him. Okay. And he wants to know what is the all-time win-loss record for the Duncan Black Holes? This is the thing about Duncan. They used to be a good squad. Like when uh, Grover's brother Montrell was there, like they were a squad. And then the team had fallen on hard times. And basically how Milk was able to get on the squad was that his dad bought the jerseys. And, like, you know, so everybody looks at these three scrub freshmen, how they made varsity. It was literally because, like, the school falling on hard times. So I think – I don't think – we we never see them winning. Like, did they win? I don't even – honestly, it's been so long. 
don't think we ever saw them win a game. And that was kind of like we were building up to that moment. Actually, they did win one when uh, Grover hit the the free throw to send them to the playoffs. So yeah. they weren't they weren't quite as trash as, as people would assume. But so, so they weren't Oak Hill or anything like that. No, never. No, nah, they were they were smoke hill. They were joke hill. Whatever you know. They were, uh, but that's the um, fun we want to have. So even with like like the, the the starters on the squad, they were all trash. Like Randy. We had a character, Yinka, who we, who we uh, named after Yinka Dari, just who was our big yeah. African. But we had, I think, more fun with just that type of shit. Like, let's give these characters, like, a lot of them were, like, inside jokes with, like, our friends and, like, me and Quinn, who, who created the show, we were big friend, uh, fans of Salim Stoudemire. So I want to say in, like, one of the first two episodes, they show a wall of fame, and uh, he's on there, but he's on there as his real name. His, first, his real first name is Charles. So we put, like, Chuck Stoudemire on the wall. But just, like... Simple shit like that. Like, we would always just be giving love to, like, people that we rocked with. Like, we gave O'Bannis love. We gave Ty Zandy love. We gave my brother love. Like, right. it was just like, you know, so I think even working on the show, like, all the inside jokes that we would have, like, just because when you're building, like, an animated show, you have to literally make everything. Like, sure. if it's graffiti, graffiti on the wall, what does the graffiti say? If it's, it's whatever, what's the name of the store? What's the name of that? So we would do, like, I remember we had, like, Michael Cage's Curl Supply. It was, like, Cage's. Cage's Curl Supply <laughs> Store. We would be like, yo, give us storefront titles. And we were just like, you know, I would have a field day with that shit. Just knowing, like, just really, like, even as a creator of the show, I wanted, I wanted people to really be authentic to the basketball world as they watched it. But honestly, yeah, yeah Duncan was trash, but at one point they were good. And the theory was that the show would have continued on. At some point, uh, Grover would have kind of really started to embrace his LeBron role and really started to, to, to get his flares out. Yeah. So – you know, obviously the big three started last night. If yeah. you were to if you were to take Grover, Jamal, and Milk, and they could play a dream game against any three players, who who, who do you think y'all would choose to play? In the big three, I'd probably go with. It doesn't have to be um, big three. It could be okay. anybody you want. A I would three go on like, three. Like LeBron, LeBron, like J.R. Ryder, just because he's one of the biggest legends ever. And uh, J.R. Ryder. <laughs> <laughs> and like Kareem or something. Like, JR, honestly, I, I grew up, so I went to Crenshaw my ninth and 10th grade year. I believe he was on the Lakers here. He just finished up his career. Yeah. So I'd be, I'd be walking home from school, and this dude would be in the hood with his Bentley, just pushing his Bentley through the hood. And it's like, bro, JR, right, you, are, you are a fucking legend, bro. Consummate. Like, still one of my favorite human beings. But I got so many, that's the thing, like, you put me on the spot. I got so many league dudes who, like, you know, from the Sharunas Marcellonis of the world, just, like, yeah. random obscure dudes that I'm, like, that I always had an affinity towards because, like, like, he played with my pops for a little bit. But, yeah, probably if we go three on three, it would be, like, LeBron. Probably let's go LeBron, Jordan, and uh, Kareem. Do y'all score against that team? No. <laughs> maybe, maybe a lucky bucket. Nothing. Maybe, like, a lucky but you know. Like, look, at any point, you, know, you can throw some shit up and it might go in. Like, if you got the ball first, maybe. But, you know. Like, Y'all do some cross and half court shit. Exactly. <laughs> like, maybe. Maybe. Well, Josiah, I'm not going to take up uh, much more of your time, man. Uh, I, listen, again, like I said, I appreciate this. I appreciate the fact that, uh, you know, again, you were want, willing and wanting to take the time. So, um, this was yeah. fun for me because, look, at the end of the day, man, like, you know, the, the, the little bit of back and forth we've been able to share just kind of through tweets and whatnot. Uh, really got to see that you were, you know, a good dude on top of just, you know, putting yeah, out sure. content that people could laugh at. So um, the pleasure for pleasure is definitely all mine for, for, you know, to do this. And uh, listen, man, if you got anything you want to plug, by all means. Uh, first, I just want to say, bro, th I, I love people like yourself that are out here doing it. And that's why I even put the, the, the call out. It's like, look, I know I, I know motherfuckers out here got podcasts and shit they doing. Like, can I get some run? I'm tired of seeing everybody else on everybody's shit. Can I get right. some run? Can I get a little run? But I appreciate, honestly, like when I do these things, just meeting people like yourself who we've connected with over Twitter. But Twitter is right. like a weird place because you don't really ever know people in real life. Like, I'm always still, when I see people, it's like, do I introduce myself as Josiah or, or my king All Josiah right. 54? It's like, you know, you always get like the weird look, like, oh, uh, whatever, like. It's like you go to it's like you go to summer league with your with your at on a white yeah, t-shirt. Exactly. I might have to do <laughs> I might have to do that this year just as like uh you know, but like you never but just to see people like yourself that are out here grinding doing shit, I always just tell people, man, whatever lane it is you in, man, just go do it. Like if you wanna yeah. do a pod, just go make it. If you wanna write a book, write it. Like if you wanna like be a coach, learn how to coach, whatever, whatever you're doing. But it's always great for me to connect with people from the space and from NBA the NBA Twitter world. 
Because I feel like, and like I've been talking to people even over at Twitter about it. It's like we're not we're a community, but we all need to really kind of be more embracing of each other. And because yeah. there's like there's like the, the the regular NBA Twitter, which is like the big name cats, and then there's like right. the underground, which I fashion myself more as like an underground. Yeah, yeah, I'm more yeah. of like there's like the house Twitter, and then there's like the field Twitter. I'm more like field oh. Twitter. You know what I'm saying? Like I, I can hang out in the house Twitter, but house NBA Twitter, but I'm more like field NBA Twitter, just always out there grinding, getting it. But so connect with people like yourself to do shit, man. I just really appreciate it. And I don't, I mean, I'm not really plugging anything. Like, y'all can follow me at King Josiah 54 across social. I love, like, just, you know, networking, building relationship with people and getting to know people and helping stuff out. So, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, if you ever want me to come back on, please let me know, man. I'm down for whatever. Yeah.